Um, yes, so uh, my name is Olivier. <coughs> I'm a teacher in the um, in the eastern suburbs uh, uh, here in Melbourne. I teach foreign languages. I teach uh, French, uh, especially. Uh, I do some research for my PhD on uh, the motivation to learn foreign languages, particularly. And I have a uh, true passion for whiskey and tennis. So, uh, so these are, uh, this is me. Uh, I'm actually going to break with my natural inclinations, and uh, and actually I'm going to read out my uh, my my, uh, my presentation. The, the the purpose of this actually is because it's going to go on the podcast. I thought it would be more podcast friendly. So, um, the uh, my year in review uh, is that um, is I wanted to talk about just uh, just a few binaries that I've been able to observe uh, this year since uh, since I've been uh, much more active on Twitter. So, um, so I'm not sure if it's uh, if it's the tendency uh, if the tendency is inherent to human psychology to think of the world into binaries. I haven't done uh, any research in that matter. But I remember my philosophy teacher in high school mentioning something about it. Uh, the idea that we evolved to that we evolved to organize the world into things that are safe and things that are unsafe, uh, things that we identify with and things that we identify as different. Um, so um, <laughs> Uh, if there's any truth to that, I've certainly been able to observe it uh, in my Twitter experience where so many exchanges, so many conversations uh, revolve around the either implicit or explicit acceptance of binaries. Um, so, for example, uh, explicit teaching versus project-based, content versus skill, what works versus what doesn't work, uh, evidence-based uh, versus instinctive. So while my position is that binaries actually do more harm than good, uh, I want to quote uh, Dido, I believe that's how you pronounce his surname, uh, who in regards to binaries said the following, uh, we, the way to square competing theories and, to, uh, and, and ideas is not to find the middle ground, uh, but to force binary oppositions into creative tension. Um, so, I kind of agree and disagree with Dido. So I agree with him uh, that attention has the potential for, uh, to create. But unfortunately, Twitter, uh, Twitter conversations have seldom delivered much creativity. Instead, they've turned more into weaponized uh, exchanges. The perverse bias of uncritically dismantling another's argument by pushing one's own, one's own perspective is that we believe that we that this qualifies at, as robust conversation. Not only do we lose any creative potential, but we also become blind to other considerations. How has a single perspective ever helped anything improve? It's not like the people we disagree with are flat earthers. In his textbook, uh, The Learning Forest, Sherrington goes to some length exploring the ins and outs of the progressives versus the traditional debate. His engagement with the educational world has led him to the general argument, and here I quote, that however we define the opposing poles of traditional and progressive pedagogy, they both have a vital role in a child's education. Goes on to explain that although he once believed the pro-trad to be a false dichotomy, he's more recently accepted that, and again this is in his own words, even if they overlap, the two camps are really distinct enough, uh, are real and distinct enough, suggesting that this, this distinction is actually useful. So I resonate a little bit more uh, with Sherrington than with Dito, but there's a couple of things that I think that uh, needs clarification. So I would suggest that the camps are real. Uh, but only because actually people engage in that debate. Um, but their distinction uh, comes from essential, not from essentially different pedagogies that they use in class. As people begin to align with others, they become entrenched in not an actual pedagogy, but what I would call an edu-political party, either the progressive or uh, the traditional. Basically, it's an ideology. And the danger in retiring uh, behind ideological walls 
is that conversations stop, thinking stops, and the teacher's voice drowns. Now, I don't pretend that differences in opinion don't exist, but a constructive dis uh, discussion should make anyone think about their position. And this is even in the case where we're convinced that science is on our side. Because we can't forget that uh, we're talking to a very large number of people who are all engage in the very complex processes of learning and teaching. And that the best science we have so far can only give us some idea of what best to accept, expect given the application of particular strategies. So in other words, we don't have the silver bullet. What I'd like to propose then is not to dichotomize ourselves into progs and trans, but to explore the actual categories that concern us and critically ask ourselves, are there really, are there really binaries? Are they opposites? If research tells us that one approach is, be is a better channel for learning than, than another, what sort of learning are we talking about? As a language teacher, I can tell you that language or foreign language education is hardly a consideration into general educational research. What is it about the other strategy that actually contributes positively to learning? What are the limitations of our own strategy or about the other one? But what I would like is to be able to, to consider those categories independently from what we perceive as being the opposite of that. Now, I'm not one to gaze away when I see a statue. Actually, I find them quite, uh, quite entertaining. And just like uh, watching a great tennis match, there's always going to be a winner and a loser. But education, unfortunately, well, fortunately, it is my profession. And for me, entertainment only goes so far. I put to you that aligning ourselves with one into one or one of two ever more ideologically uh, oriented camps is very much working against us. Through years of top-down education policies, we've turned our schools into businesses and we've become a field of work that has lost its professional status, something that we've heard from quite a few of you already tonight. And as Alan Reid said in the last TR podcast, I thought I'd put that one in, that we've become merely technicians. In recent years, uh, the likes of Tom Bennett have emerged uh, pretty much everywhere. Uh, leaders organizing teachers into critical and vocal groups. These groups of teachers have begun to form, take action to inform each other, uh, to share and to empower each other. It's extremely frustrating though, that just as Napoleon had once been, or almost been, the leader of what could have been an early democratic France, he then turned around and proclaimed himself emperor. <laughs> we are seeing, and this is a personal opinion, but we are seeing the point. Here's a good play on words for me, I'm very proud of this one. <laughs> we are seeing the polarizing shining star of Edugurus. <laughs> okay. I won't repeat that one, you can play it again on the audio. <laughs> What I would like is to hold those edugurus to their moral responsibilities. And that does not include to know the truth about teaching. <clears throat> because once we believe that we have the truth, any dialogue dies with our voice. If we do identify uh, some leaders among us, and there will be some of course, what is it that we want? Do we want a democratic approach? For the Buddha, a little. <laughs> Where all have a voice in a non threatening environment, or do we want just a new emperor? 